now stand at 107, 849 tests done between the private and the public sector, with a total number of cases at 15 reported over the last 24 hours, taking our total number up to 7,939 since 12th of March 2020. Our total recovered patients thus far stand at 7,581. Total active cases, 217. Our deaths now stand at 142. We would have had one additional death after for, uh, yes, after, yesterday afternoon of an elderly female with comorbidities, and condolences go out to the family of that individual. Our step-down facilities have three persons in it, and our home isolation now stands at 186. Our quarantine facilities are 141. With regards to the step to the hospitals, we have seven persons in the Cooper Hospital and Multi-Training Facility, one person in ICU as of yesterday afternoon. For a hospital, there are three persons. Scarborough Regional Hospital at Fort King George, there are three persons. And at the step-down facilities, UE Davey, there are three persons as well. With respect to quarantine facilities, we would have had one repatriation flight yesterday afternoon, bringing in 18 other individuals from Barbados, taking our tally now up to 159. And those people are and at a number of facilities. Cape Oak Hotel has 35 of those. Cascadia Hotel, 7. Chancellor Hotel, 15. Region Star, 27. Trade Winds, 13. Paria Suites, 16. Paria Suites, 9. Napa, and no one in our HDU at this point in time. I'll now call on Dr. Hines if he can come to the podium and give us our epidemiological update. Thank you, Dr. Parastram, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers, Dr. Trotman, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public, good afternoon. Uh, the epidemiological update for today stands as follows. What we would be seeing, what we've been noting, what we've uh, observed over the past two weeks or so has been a slow but steady increase in the number of daily cases being identified. Now, we've been observing this over the period from about the 9th of March or so to present. We would recall that around that time, first week of March, we were having average daily numbers at rolling seven-day average that we'd spoken about of about three cases per day or so. The current daily or seven-day average is 17. That's a great increase from the average of three a couple of weeks ago. And if we look at the numbers that have been reported, we saw them going up from three or four to six or seven to 10 or 11. We saw a number as high as 38 somewhere in that uh, in the past few days, within the past week. And uh, we are observing that that sort of distribution of cases and the links between the cases, again, follows a fairly similar pattern to what we will describe in those uh, the weekly or the, the bi-weekly press conferences that are hosted by the Ministry of Health. When we look at where people have been, we look at who they've been in contact with, we're seeing certain patterns of activity again uh, rearing their heads, including those individuals who attend indoor gatherings, those individuals who may be ill and going to gatherings, for example, church or otherwise. And we're seeing that that distribution was largely concentrated in the county Kearney about two weeks ago, but we're seeing spillover into adjacent counties at this point in time. A lot of activity in the St. Patrick, Penal Day Bay area, uh, still activity in, in county Kearney and activity in St. George East and Central. Now, Trinidad being a small population, once there's an increase in activity anywhere, there's a risk of an increase in activity everywhere. And as a result of this, we are again reiterating the importance of trying to adhere to the guidelines. We are seeing, just anecdotally, people are reporting uh, outdoor gatherings, large numbers, people with, uh, without masks, that sort of thing, things that 
are indicative of fatigue with following the instructions, but the extent to which we do this, the extent to which we deviate from the recommended behaviors, reflects itself in the change in numbers. And what we've been seeing over the last two weeks would probably then correlate with changes in behavior from the two weeks before that. And it is for this reason that we want to, again, double down on people being disciplined in their behavior, being tolerant of a little bit of the inconvenience that we are currently experiencing with respect to the restrictions. And in so doing, we can maintain a certain level of production, a certain level of productivity with our movements. But if we don't do that, then we're going to, we're going to run into a, a place where we continue to have increasing numbers of cases. One of the things we noted is that among the people who present with respiratory illness and who are swabbed, we were having lower percentages of those being COVID positive. 2 to 3 percent. That's now up to 5 to 6 percent. These are indications that we do need to start paying a lot more attention to what we're doing in our day-to-day -day activities. A lot of the stuff that we've spoken about, a lot of the activity within the office that, that, we, that we saw people acknowledge didn't go the way it should, mask wearing indoors in offices, that sort of thing. All of those things that people may be getting a little tired of, we still need to hold on to. It's extremely important that we adhere to these as these trends manifest themselves. One of the, uh, one of the points that we noted is that the increases that we saw in the numbers, in the rolling average and the daily numbers of cases, actually came approximately about two weeks after the uh, release of the restrictions on gatherings for sport. And we're aware that some of that may be not so much associated with the sport itself, but with all the camaraderie and the, the mingling that happens before and after and during on the sidelines. The general increase in mobility and decrease in mask wearing, all of these things that we're seeing across the population are now manifesting themselves in the increasing numbers. And it's at this point we really need to call it to the attention of the population that we need individually to take stock, individually to enhance the level of responsibility in our behaviors if we want to put the brakes on this increasing trend. So I'm going to bring it to an end there and turn you back over to, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Trotman. Honorable Prime Minister, Ministers, CMO, uh, my fellow um, team members, members of the media, members of the health public, members of the listening and viewing public. It is again my honor to stand before you and literally beg again. Simple. Distance, sanitize, mask, DSM, especially now as we see those numbers wanting to climb up and actually climbing up. We stand on our foundation. The found, once we stand on that foundation, we will be strong. Without it, we will probably fall. It is my job, part of my job clinically to review cases that would come in that are suspect or end up being positive. And I want to underscore what Dr. Hines has said, that many of them are linked to us not wearing our mask. Many of them are linked to us being part of gatherings in which others are not wearing masks. So it is very simple that as we await the next step, we need to continue with the foundation. We are looking into a holiday period, and the holiday period that comes after a time of, of, of much, in a sense, a period that has been long and arduous in terms of restrictions in behavior. And so one of the automatic things to do is to change your behavior. And we're asking that you do not change your behavior. And we want to thank those of you 
who are doing your distance sanitizing and mask DSM. Going into our holiday period and looking forward to more of our school children being able to move about and, and participate in, in their activities. Let us lay the foundation by getting those numbers back down. People hear vaccinations are coming and they think it's all over. Well, it continues. It continues with us standing on the foundation. And I encourage you all, when you are offered, to please take your vaccine. But in the meantime, to please continue to distance, sanitize, and mask. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trot Dr. Trotman. And um, at this stage, I would like to ask the Minister of Health to bring us up to date in the situation with respect to our expectation, our receipt, and our use of vaccines as we commence our national inoculation program. Thank you very much, Honorable Prime Minister, Ministers, CMO, uh, Doctors. Um, the update on the vaccine arrival goes like this. The vaccines are currently en route to Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, let me explain to you for those who travel and you know the many stops you have to make. These vaccines are coming from South Korea, from a firm called South Korea Bio. It's a WHO AstraZeneca approved vaccine and a WHO approved vaccine manufacturing site. So both the vaccine is uh, certified by WHO and the site is certified by WHO. The other AstraZeneca site certified by WHO is Serum Institute of India. But this first tranche is coming from SK Bio. So they are manufactured in um, South Korea. They then have to be transported to Brussels, from Brussels to Amsterdam, then from Amsterdam to Miami, and from Miami to Trinidad and Tobago. So that vaccine shipment is logging up a lot of frequent flyer miles. The current estimated date of arrival, current, uh, please, because many things can happen. The current estimated date of arrival is Tuesday the 30th at 6.10 p.m., if everything goes according to plans, if all the flights are on time, if there are no weather delays or anything like that. So that's the current thing. This is a spread risk. Just in case one side goes down, you don't lose everything. Even though both sides have backup generators and alarms and all of that, we are just being ultra careful. Once the vaccines are here and the cold chain is certified, we then start distribution across 21 sites in Trinidad and Tobago. The, if again, if all goes according to plan, the Tobago shipment of 3,000 goes to Tobago on Thursday, which will be Thursday coming. Then we distribute to all the other sites in Trinidad over the Easter weekend. The plan is to start the national rollout on the Tuesday after Easter. So you have the Easter weekend. We will be working over the weekend, distributing, getting everything ready, getting our IT ready, all the consumables. The plan at this time is to start the national rollout vaccination plan on Tuesday. What's the date on Tuesday? Um, fifth? No, next week, Tuesday. Second, whatever that date is. Six. Tuesday the 6th. Good. So we start on Tuesday the 6th um, with the National Vaccination Rollout Program. Who are we vaccinating in this first phase? As we have said all along, and the reason why we can communicate the total vaccination plan before this is because we were uncertain about the numbers. 
because we didn't want to alert people and communicate we are vaccinated and then the numbers go down and then people get disappointed. You would remember it was initially 177,000, then they went to 33,000, then there was talk up to last week that that 33 may have been cut even further, but now we are certain it's 33,000. Those 33,000 doses as per COVAX policy based on equity, vaccinating those who have the highest exposure and the highest risk in the first instance, we will continue our frontline healthcare workers. As you know, with the gift we got from Barbados, we have already vaccinated about 1,120 frontline healthcare workers. It is our intention to continue that that out of it. Simultaneously, we will start to vaccinate those persons over 60 in our non-communicable diseases clinics in the public health care sector. Those persons are already known to us and they will be vaccinated on their clinic days. Okay, So if your clinic days are Monday and you go to that health center, you will be vaccinated. We also plan on the non-clinic days to open it up to members of the general public over 60 again with NCDs, but by appointment only. So each so in the coming days, all this information will be disseminated. Uh, the communication plan will roll out in full now that we know how many vaccines we are getting. So let me just go back. We start with healthcare workers. We start with persons over six in our NCD clinics. And on non-NCD clinic days, we will start to open it up to members of the general public over 60 with NCDs by appointment only. Appointments could be made online or by telephone or by going to your local health center and putting your name down. Uh, what, what we don't want to happen is throngs of people come in and waiting in sun and all that is going to be by appointment only. When you get your vaccination, we are asking people to walk with your existing vaccination card so we could record that you have in fact received your first shot and on that card will be uh, a reminder of where to come back for your second shot. So you'll have a written record. Whilst we are doing that, the IT system will also automatically track that and remind you with emails, if you have emails or telephone calls, to come back for your second dose. So that will more or less um, eat up our 33,600 doses. But remember, in that first tranche, being a two-dose regime, will be going after maybe about 16,000 persons in the first tranche because we'll have to reserve um, the second shot for those persons. Um, yesterday, as members of the media would have known, we started in earnest our communications plan. We had a, a media workshop yesterday, and in coming days, you will start to see our media program roll out um, in mass media, social media, and so on. So that is where we are right now with the receipt of vaccines and the plans for our national rollout. Thank you very much, Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Minister Dial Singh. Ladies and gentlemen, children, I think this is an appropriate time for us to back up a little bit to see where we are at. I know that after a year of appealing to you, our appeals might now become annoying to some people. And I also know that following a regime of do's and don'ts like this for a year, it is humanly likely that some people, even many people, could begin to feel tired and would look for the first opportunity for relief to become not constrained 
by the mundane exhortations of Dr. Trotman and to a lesser extent the minister and the CMO. But now more than ever is when we need to reap the benefits of the sacrifices that we have made. And today I want to appeal to the national population to not get tired. Do not become COVID weary because it only takes the drop in the guard of a few people and the irresponsible conduct of a few people, maybe one or two parties, maybe one or two lines to put us on a slope to go backwards. I had the opportunity before I came to this press conference to review the data as expressed on charts and maps with the medical team and I was hoping that I would have been able to share it with the public here but we, um, that thought came up a little too late but I'm asking the team to do so on Monday, Monday. so you can actually see the visuals of what I'm trying to say. It is very easy for us to lose our position of not being overwhelmed by the virus. I was alarmed in the last week when we were suffering from vaccine mania. Where every topic and I was an expert on what's happening with the vaccine and even what the minister just told you. We were being told that we should have been saying that before, which we couldn't have done until we knew that vaccines were actually physically on their way. We couldn't be telling you with any confidence that we would do what the minister just said. As a matter of fact, um, not too long ago when I sat in the conversation with the population, it was to tell you that we couldn't do that because we were unsure we have an idea of what is being put in place, but until there was confirmation, especially since prior uh, dates were not being met, we could not give you the impression that we have days in mind and times in mind. Now we know that our vaccine is on board. We know the source, we know the, we have the, way, the way bill number. The minister could tell you what day in Tobago and what day in Trinidad, and still we are hoping that there are no delays on that long route and in the, in, in, in the handling of the equipment and so on. So we, we're there. But to hear people who are in a position to influence public opinion in this country talk about we being post-pandemic period and therefore we should be doing X, Y, Z, is to expose us to exactly what I'm asking us not to do. We are not in a post-pandemic period. Nowhere in the world is in a post-pandemic period. We are still very much in the pandemic as declared in early 2020. Because we in Trinidad and Tobago, by our gentle movement forward to come back to a better place, have been having the benefit of not being overcome by the regulations or the virus itself. It, it would be irresponsible for us to believe that we are in a post-pandemic, meaning that we are living and operating after the virus. You only have to look at other people who drop their guard for one reason or the other to see how quickly the situation reverted to the very dangerous pandemic conditions where national health systems are overwhelmed, the economy is back in trouble, and death and destruction is the order of the day. We are maybe one party away or one fool away from that, but we could easily avoid it, that pitfall, by not doing the things that we know we ought not to be doing. And they are basically the simple things, as well as the personal responsibility things. So today, I want to look at the consequences. Maybe it's because of the job that I have. The consequences of us 
having to go to take actions to prevent a spike from becoming an overcoming condition. I looked at the map of where the problem arises, County Victoria, that the consequences of that occurring in the East West Corridor, in Port of Spain, or in other densely populated areas are very grave. And let me point out to the country by way of repeating myself. If we find ourselves in a situation where the action that is required to confront an outbreak are the actions that we had to do in early 2020, the consequences will be personally for you very serious. One, there would be no resources to provide a government bailout. So those of you who know who you are, the many tens of thousands of you who received a government check, and all of you kept very quiet when you got it. The handful of people who didn't get it made a lot of noise. But those of you, the tens of thousands of you who received a government check, I'm putting you on notice now. If we, as a population, find ourselves back in that situation, where those are the decisions to be made and the actions to be taken, there are no resources to hand out checks like that. If you are in the business community and you are one of those who got a government check as any part of the response, whether it was a VAT refund, whether it was support for your business and so on, the resources have been used up. If it is that you relied very heavily on a government food box that we gave out, tens of thousands of those that came to your household, you know who you are and you know what you got. It was not free. It was paid for by the government. If we find ourselves having to ask you to stay home and your bosses ask you not to come to work because they are closing the door of the business because they can't pay salaries because they have no income coming into the business, if you are one of those people, just remember, those are the consequences that are likely to flow if we do not stay the course as is required. I know there are voices who are telling you about the benefits to be had if we make the changes. Open up this and open up that as if we're not in a pandemic. But of course, if we tell ourselves that we are in the post-pandemic, well then the open up this and the open up that for those benefits are good conversations. What they're not telling you in seeking to get those benefits are the consequences of overreach or carelessness. I prefer to err on the side of respecting the consequences because they are so grave. And of course, we take the benefits, not in gulps, but in sips. Last year, as we approached the Christmas season, I stood at the same podium and I told you, if we come out of the Christmas and the New Year period, being a responsible population, that we can get the benefit of getting some of our children out to school. Thankfully, that situation was achieved. We came out of those festive days. The numbers were sufficiently low to allow us to bring our children, the senior children, out to school without much repercussion. At the time, there were one or two voices who maybe cautiously were saying that we were being irresponsible, but I can report to you today that that action of bringing our children out We've been very successful, Knockwood. We had one instance in the school in Tobago where one child was infected. It may be that the child was infected somewhere else for that matter, but was a school child. And of course, the consequences of contact tracing around, we did all of that. So we have our schools open partially. The next objective, the next hurdle for me and for the Ministry of Health and the parent, Ministry of Education and the parents is what we said, what we're looking forward to after Easter. If we are in a similar position, after the Easter vacation, then we are, and we've told you, that for the first time in a year, we'll be bringing out our senior primary school children. 
don't know if many of you who are not associated with children have any idea how positive that action is to be able to get these youngsters out to school. It, it, if, you, if you are around children, you will know what I'm talking about. If you are not, you will think it's just old talk. But the idea of bringing these children out to school after a year of not being able to go to school is a mental and psychological lift for this country that you cannot put a dollar figure on. And I'm appealing to the rest of the population. In your attempt to enjoy the post-pandemic prematurely, or just to be generally irresponsible and even destructive, think about what you are risking when you believe that you have to go bar hopping, or you have to hug your friends who you have a drink with, in a restaurant that is not supposed to be serving alcohol. Just think about the consequences of the simple action of yours that may trigger a national drawback. Please, I'm appealing to you. It reminds me of a time when over 40 years ago, I was a student in the United Kingdom and I go out traveling all over the country. And I was out in the, in, in, the, in the Lake District, and there was a very, very steep road. You know, very, the gradient was extremely steep. And there were corners on the road, and there were warning signs. As soon as you approached the area, there were very prominent warning signs telling all drivers to gear down and do not exceed a certain speed limit. And the signs were there all the time. And then eventually there's a huge sign which simply said, you have been warned. And that is where we are in Trinidad and Tobago today. You have been warned that we are in a relatively good position, but by our individual actions, we could change these circumstances for the worse, and the consequences would be harsh at the personal level. I know there are some people who live in this country but believe that the country is another creature which is of no consequence to them and their only connection to it is bad mouth in the government. This is not a government issue. It's not a political party issue either because the virus does not acknowledge those of your condition. And of course, when you look at it like that, you leave it up to the leadership of the country, which brings us to the point. Who is the country's leadership? It's not the Prime Minister alone. Not the Minister of Health alone. It's not the CMO alone. It is every person who could influence another person. That makes you, in this situation, a leader. And that is why, today, I want to identify the public position taken by Archbishop Gordon, who has spoken to those who he influences, including the national community, to take these exhortations seriously, to take our response to the virus seriously. And I'm sure that there are many people who would listen to him in a way that they would not listen to me or to you, media personnel. And that is why I feel so strongly about us holding this course after a year of sacrifices that I want today to appeal to every person who believes that he or she is a leader of a group in the days ahead to make that kind of appeal and take a kind of public position to those who you may influence to please in this situation in the days and weeks ahead to give priority to our individual behavior in responding to the virus. If we do that, we will save ourselves the problem and the millions of dollars that would be actually wasted in trying to respond to a second wave or a third wave. Every person who is the leader of anything, whether it is your football club, the Queen's Park Club, the Presbyterian Church, the Mahasabha, if you are in a leadership position, we are in this fight together. And I make that appeal today also to the opposition leader. Because there are many people in this country 
especially those who get the news from social media, where technology is useful, but technology is also bringing out the stupidity that lies in the underbelly of the population. Every leader in the next few days, ask your flock to pay attention and to cooperate. And I guarantee you, if we do that, we will come out of the next couple of weeks in a way that will allow our primary school children to enjoy what they have been deprived of for a year. Do that for the children. We have a holiday on Tuesday. It's a funny, the next week or at 8 to 10, it's a funny period. Likely to invite a certain kind of behavior. Holiday on Tuesday, holiday on Friday, and there are many people who don't see Wednesday and Thursday between those days. And the holiday on the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Holiday on Monday. So this is an environment which is tailor-made for creating spread if people behave in a certain way. I'm appealing to you, my fellow citizens, to in the, if you have not been behaving well, at least the next 10 days, work hard and try to cooperate take us over that period to some semblance of pandemic normalcy on the day when we start the vaccination program. One of the things that could and might be triggering a relaxation is the fact that vaccines are, have been here and are on the way. I, was, I, I must tell you, I was amazed at how 2,000 vaccines that was given to me as a just a gift for with the intention that it would have been used to vaccinate um, the cabinet and the permanent secretaries and the commissioner of police and people like that who are that sort of thing. That was the intention. It wasn't that he rolled out of our vaccination program. We got them. We dealt with a thousand people. And boy, did that trigger vaccine mania in Trinidad and Tobago until it got all the way to Delhi. Right? And then all of a sudden I was reading the papers about friction between Trinidad and Tobago and India. Total dotishness. But of course I guess it was the tiredness because there are some people in this country who unfortunately unless something is going wrong unless something bad happens they don't seem to have enjoyed their breakfast. But we have to live with that. We are in fact in a good position we don't have very many people hospitalized. We don't have very many people today seeking medical care. And we don't have a, a system that is overwhelmed by the effects of this virus. But it could change very quickly. Change very quickly. And we've put certain things in place to encourage those persons who need encouragement. Law enforcement is not for the government as a cabinet, but it's for the government affected through a department of state, which is the police. I, as head of the National Security Council, can speak to the police about general things in their operations. I can't speak to them about who, but I can speak to them about what. And today, Given the importance of this situation, I will publicly call on the police in the what aspect to do their jobs with enthusiasm, greater enthusiasm, to take us beyond the threats of the coming days, to ensure that those who are bent on ignoring the very fundamental response that we have and that fundamental response is to not congregate and, of course, to wear a mask. Those two things, if you are out of your home environment, you are required to be masked. If you are in a group of more than 10, and I'm sure you're not a child, everybody of adult age in this country should be able to count. If you find yourself in a group of more than 10, just understand that you are in an arrestable situation because all that is permitted outside of like a place of worship that you are in it where there are certain conditions as to how much could be in the building. 
But if you are in a group outside of a bar and all of you have bought a beer, and you, you need to be counting. Because if you are in a group of more than 10, you are in a situation where the police pick up 5 or 10 to spend the weekend in an uncomfortable place. I will do it. And of course, I've seen and I've confirmed that there are people who are breaching the regulations about the serving of alcohol in places where alcohol should not be served. And we have good reason to believe that when you look at the map, there's a relationship between this kind of breach and what we are seeing on the map. We know that the police has the way of it all to prevent that from happening. Not every restaurant that's doing that that the police has to act against. But if they set about to do their job within the law, I don't think any owner wants the heavy hand of the law. If you're breaking the law, the police has the authority to prevent that condition from prevailing to the detriment of the national population. So if you find yourself serving alcohol in styrofoam cups or serving alcohol as water, I'm sure there's no group of people in this country who can detect alcohol more than the police. It has a smell, it has a taste. And therefore, if you are doing that, I would read the papers and I would see that the police close down your business place. I don't know. I might do that. The bottom line is that we have to enforce the laws that we have put in place to protect the population, to protect the children's schooling, to protect those who have comorbidities, to protect those who are aged and are exposed, and of course, to protect the young people who believe that they are beyond the virus and they are immune and invincible. I've seen too many examples of young people who are unfortunately not in our country who have succumbed to that. So we expect that the next few days would be days of relaxation. But let that relaxation not be the relaxation of our response to the virus. A lot of people will be going to Tobago and I hear that there might be go to this. I don't know if that has been cleared with you all, but in the event that that is so, just ensure if the event of goat racing is taking place at the venue, just ensure that the conditions of the venue are set and met with adequate law enforcement. And of course, um, the ferries will be available. We love to have as many Trinidadians in Tobago and to get to be going in Trinidad over the season. But wherever you are, whatever you do, you're doing it in a pandemic, 2021 pandemic. Please do not congregate. It could get you arrested, it could get you damaged, and it could get the country also obstructed. And the Baptist Liberation uh, Acknowledgement is Tuesday, so within 48 hours or be more, more, we'll be there. I want to appeal to the Baptist community to celebrate in a different way this time, without crowds, without exposure, and I know that you are a very disciplined component of our national population, and you would do so. But I'm just reminding you, and I take the opportunity at this time to acknowledge all that we usually do on March 30th, which is to acknowledge how far we have come as a people in acknowledging the presence and the cultural aspect of religion and education associated with the spiritual Baptist cohort of our national population. I wish you safe period and greater safety as you set the example going into this few days of celebration. And the same thing applies to those of you who are members of the other Christian communities who celebrate Easter. It's one of the loveliest time of the times of the year and it's also a time of great reflection. So use that reflection to be responsible as you reflect over the virus that we are fighting. And as we look at what is happening in our region, in South America, 
in Europe, and you see, there but for the grace of God, go to Trinidad and Tobago. We have been blessed so far. Let us not choose curse by our own inactions. And of course, in all of this, there is some good news that I could tell you that our sister ship to the APT James, the Boko Reef, has just made its trip across the Pacific Ocean. It's now at the Panama Canal, awaiting its transit, transit across the canal, which might take between two and five days. And once it has transited the canal, it will be really on the home stretch to Trinidad and Tobago. That is really a historic visit, travel, of a vessel designed and built for Trinidad and Tobago in Tasmania. And has traveled all the way home from Tasmania through Brisbane to Papiti. And now, almost 7,000 miles later, is approaching the safety of the Caribbean Sea. So, that is some good news in the middle of it. So, let me just say, once again, we expect increased police activity in enforcing the requisite laws. We expect persons to be reflective over Easter and at Baptist Liberation. And, of course, do not act as though we are in a post-pandemic. We are in a pandemic, behaving well to see ourselves true. And until we are properly vaccinated with vaccines that are efficacious, we, would not, we should not begin to exhale. Let me just finally say this, eh? and Dr. Parasram, may you may, by your questions, he may give you more details. The vaccines are not curative. They're not cures. It's a defense mechanism. It's a defense that we take upon ourselves at the individual level to defend us from what may come our way later on. It's a preparation of the body to treat with an exposure that might come your way from the population that we are part of. Vaccination does not mean that you're taking something that will cure you and is a treatment for a sickness that would come. It's not that at all. And maybe Dr. Um, that's a good point for me to stop and ask Dr. Parasram to give us, the laymen and women of the country, a little discourse on what a vaccine is and what it is meant to do, especially for those who believe that they're not taking it because there's something called, well, I shouldn't say that because I, do, I, I always get into trouble when I say these things, but there are some people who cannot explain to you logically why they're not taking it. But is there right? Our program of vaccination is voluntary. Um, there were areas in the world that were threatened in a serious way. It was not voluntary. And as a matter of fact, you couldn't even come out of your door of your house because the state made sure that you were where you're supposed to be. And if you were not there, you were in big trouble. You know, we have, we have had our population here fed a diet of all kind of pseudo-legal gobbledygook about how we take taken away their rights and we made them stateless and all kind of thing by closing the border to people who wanted to come in from the most heavily infected area in the world. You know in the UK now, if you leave England now, leave and eh, not come in, if you leave without good reason, there's a penalty of £5,000. That is about almost 50,000 Trinidad and Tobago dollars to leave England to go anywhere without permission and a, good, and a good reason to do so. So those who believe that this thing about taking border closure as an action to protect populations is because we here will somehow just drink something and, get, and turn stupid world overnight or become dictatorial as they say or are arrogant and bullying and just want to... Um, close it to, to, to uh, abuse our authority to say who come and who go. Understand that if those actions are what have to be taken, governments will take them. And in Trinidad and Tobago, we have demonstrated, while we understand the inconvenience, the difficulty, the actions that were required and that are required to protect the population. As Prime Minister, in the beginning, I told you, I will not hesitate to take those actions and so it continues. So 
um, see, I'm going to give us a little discourse on vaccines and vaccination and the benefit of an inoculated population. Okay, so um, just we have simple definition. A vaccine is really some substance external to your body that is created that you inject or sometimes inhale so you get it into your body in one form or the other and the hope is that it will produce an immune response. It does this by actually increasing the production of something called antibodies which is a component of the of the blood system that actually acts to defend your system from viruses, bacteria or other agents that come from the outside in. So basically the formulations that we have come in different components and we have spoken to them in terms of platforms throughout the pandemic and coming up to this point with regards to vaccines. So you have different types. You have types that can be an inactivated portion, for example, of SARS-CoV. You have a little portion of it, the spike protein. They use that to mimic the response. It produces the antibody response. What is hoped to happen by vaccination is, is immunization and, and building of immunity. There are different endpoints in terms of what you want to achieve when you build a vaccine. Some people build a vaccine to actually prevent severe disease, meaning severity, people wouldn't be hospitalized, people wouldn't die if you have a vaccine, especially for emergency use authorization like for COVID-19. The primary goal was to create a vaccine that will prevent as many deaths and as many hospitalizations as possible. What we have learned as well is that they have the other benefit in some instances, of course, of decreasing the likelihood of symptoms altogether. And some of the vaccines, for example, AstraZeneca, also have an additional benefit, which actually decreases the risk of you being infected by the virus, which is something very useful by way of protecting the population and decreasing the likelihood of spread. So the way we, we check that is basically you do nasopharyngeal swabs, the same PCR that we do so you do that as, while, after persons are vaccinated and you see what the likelihood of them actually having virus in the nasal pharynx. And what we saw for AstraZeneca is there was a 67% reduction in the persons being infected. Now, that is not the same for other va vaccines that haven't been proven, but it is proven for AstraZeneca. What we want to achieve in our population by way of vaccination is two things. First of all, protect the vulnerable people. So we want to protect, and that's how we get our phases protect people who can either be exposed on a, high, on a daily basis, for example, healthcare workers. We want to protect people who become very ill and die if they get infected. So those people are people over 60 we have seen and persons who have non-communicable diseases. Other than that, our second goal is really to achieve herd immunity, which is getting up to a point in your population where you actually have decreasing the likelihood of transmission by creating a herd of immunized people. The, when you do the calculations, it's roughly between 60 to 70 percent of this population that will have to be vaccinated before we get to that stage. You can also get immunity from being infected previously. But the overall herd we want to create is somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. There's no special number, but it gives you a rough guide as to what we are trying to achieve. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Dr. Parastram. And I simply want to come back to in, in, in light of what we've said all along to wrap it at this point with what Dr. Hines said as he reported on our numbers. He used the phrase slow but steady to describe what our curve has been doing. I want you to focus on steady. The danger lies not in the slow but in the steady because that steady is what we don't want at all. Because once you begin to double those numbers within a short number of time, days, it gets out of, you know, out of control very easily. It's like you know, putting some energy into starting a flywheel. It turns very slowly, and as it gets, when it begins to spin very quickly, stop, and to open the floor for questions on the media, and um, we will take the questions as you bring them in. Try and let us have only questions about the pandemic issues first, and then if there are non-pandemic questions, and we have time, I will try to answer a few of those questions. Let's keep the questions in the first part, 
with respect to COVID and associated issues. The floor is open to the media. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, let me begin by saying I like your shirt. I'm sure you're aware of the connection between your shirt and locking down the country by now. And before we're in a nice flourishing day. Um, if you can clarify for us, uh, probably even the new Minister of National Security can, uh, this issue of public and private with 10 people in gathering. You're calling on the police to enforce the law, and there has been many confusion about that. So if we can get a, a full clarification. As, as the minister gets there, um, a lot of what we are worried about here is the public space gathering, which has been going on, and of course, additional to that, a private um, organizing, organization of private issues that could have a public um, outcome. So, Minister, please take... Thank, thank you very much. Um, afternoon, members in the media, wider viewing, listening, public, or Trinidad and Tobago. Before I go there, there's just one addition I'd like to make to when the Prime Minister was reminding the country about the type of behavior that's expected and what is arrestable. The public health regulations also make it an offense, a criminal offense, for persons purchasing alcohol in bars to consume them within the precincts of the bar area. So this phenomenon of people lying, um, liming outside and just saying, well, I'm in a group of 10, that is still in breach. This public-private discussion, as you know, has been going on for months. I mean, the law remains the same. The police and public health regulators do have the ability under the existing law to enter private premises. We are looking, as the Prime Minister said, the law is very clear when it comes to public premises. There's to be no gathering of more than 10 in public premises, pu public areas, sorry, that's easily defined. If there is a risk of a health hazard as defined by the medical persons, they do have a right of entry. The police always have their persuasive powers. Persons should not obstruct police in the use of their powers um, when, when carrying out their duties. That is what can land you in trouble with arrestable offences outside of the public health regulations that we've been, become accustomed to. Of course, just to add to the moral suasion, the virus doesn't care if you're in a private setting, liming, drinking, droplets flying all over the place onto each other, or if you're in a public setting a few feet away. So what we're really doing and why we've never gone along that road of putting the law in place to, for, for the private citizens. This is moral suasion. Let, let's be honest. And we do know that there are a lot of these private gatherings going on and we're asking persons to just be responsible. But the, the law does permit for public health officers in a pandemic if they believe there's a risk of activity taking place to enter with the assistance of police. And then when the police are inside there, they have all of their um, normal chargeable offenses. Do you have any comments towards or for the public regarding the Attorney General being at a private event, um, more than 10 people, all of them on mass. This was carried live, I think, the day before yesterday. My comment on that is that um, that is disappointing because, as like I said earlier on today, I expect every person in a leadership position in this country to demonstrate that leadership wherever you are or whenever you are out. So I'm not giving any passes to anybody. And on that issue, possibly this for the Minister of National Security, but I'm asking the Prime Minister, um, if it wasn't yesterday, it would have been the day before yesterday, the issue of paying tickets when you're fined for wearing or not wearing masks, um, that is still still an issue. You can't pay those fines. Uh, how soon would that be rectified? I, I understand that there's, there's some difficulty at the level of the, at the judiciary. The judiciary. Yeah. And I've signed something recently which ought to eliminate that. Um, so the government 
can only go so far and somebody else picks it up from there. So that problem exists and I, my, the la my last information is on what was brought to me for clearance to rectify some problem, payment issue in there should have been clarified. Should, Maybe should the have. lawyer can tell you better. So, so what's happened is, as you all know, the judiciary has slowed down the public um, interaction, the interaction with public, which includes the payment of fines. So what we've been doing is trying to assist through a legislative process, and we've been passing a number of laws. The last hurdle, as I understand it, which I believe the Prime Minister may have addressed via some um, advice from the Attorney General recently, is with the electronic payment of fines and then using credit cards, etc. There is a, a surcharge on top of it, and the, the way the law is written, it never foresaw that. So if you're paying $100, the current laws don't have $100 plus a 3% and this type of thing. So that's being worked out. The Attorney General is driving that process, and um, hopefully we will get there very, very shortly on the judiciary side. Um, Sorry. Uh, the, uh, how shortly is very, very shortly? <laughs> I, I can't give the answer to that. Follow-up from his question, Alyssa Boucher from TV6. Would, I, I know usually when you're ticketed, you're given a certain uh, period to pay the ticket. Would this now apply to persons who were, let's say, ticketed two months ago? Co correct. So I think also what the Prime Minister may have signed off on recently is uh, uh, extension of time to cover that because you're right normally with a ticket I think you have 14 days to pay your ticket or to contest the ticket etc so not only with the mask fines but also other fines that have to be paid with the judiciary we've granted an extension of time whilst these things are being worked out uh, because persons have been telling us from day one they want to go and pay their fine and they've not been in a position to do so and if you leave it automatically they can then the court can then issue a summons for you and the police can pick you up so we've put the the extensions of time in place via legal methods to ensure that doesn't happen are you aware of how many fines are issued for I actually saw the figures from the, well, only for the masks and or breach of the public health regulations. I, I saw the figures from the police service within the last couple of days, but I don't want to, to give you an inaccurate figure. I'm sure that can be made available. What well, I think I saw was in the order of 1,000. No, 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 much, much, more, much than, more than that. Much more than that. I think it, it was, it was seven, 7 or 14,000, if I remember correctly. Okay. Well, Sorry, um, Minister Young, uh, probably even the Prime Minister. Right now, vaccines are not mandatory. We're encouraging people to take it. What would need to happen, if anything at all, for, yeah, for us to make that mandatory? That, that is a constitutional yeah. question, Prime Minister. We, we can't. You, you need a. You, you, you could if you Correct. pass the requisite law. Correct. But under the current laws, you know, you would not be able to force a person to take into their body something that they say no to. Um, it is uh, it is such a, an invasive yeah. situation that the population has been brought up to leave that decision to you. For example, but there are, there are, there are instances where it's pretty much enforced, like children going to school. You, you have, children have to be vaccinated for certain things to get into the school system. But there's not a law saying you must vaccinate that child, if you get my drift. The schools also don't accept you if you don't vaccinate the child. But the schools will do that only on the government's policy, that they are required to be vaccinated to be in school. For the same reason that there could be a, an infection and, um, you know, the coroner is that the child needs to be protected from that. But you know, um, it's not, this vaccination to COVID is not anything new as some people making it. It's the same thing like uh, the other vaccination that you had. It's a question of there's something there that could hurt you or kill you or dis disfigure you and you take protection against it. Some people say not at all. And some people say, I need to be protected I mean, so but, if, but we, if we if we if we have to enforce it and we're not in that situation 
it would require a law that specifically is passed for that purpose. Correct. Just to answer the previous question, I found it. So from the 6th of September 2020 until Thursday, the 25th of March, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service have issued a total of 7,140 tickets under the public health regulations. 7,140. Okay, and I, again, given that the long run of this whole vaccination process is achieving the herd immunity, I wanted to ask whether or not the government is at this time considering linking vaccination in any way to travel, whether it's persons coming into the country being required to be vaccinated or persons leaving the country being required to be vaccinated. Well, we have not established that, but as the vaccination regime progresses, those are policy positions that we have to address. For example, if the external populations are vaccinated to a certain level and we are wanting to open up borders as we want to, it seems to me that what will flow from that is that a vaccination, once the efficacy of the vaccines are confirmed and the rule that they play against um, the virus spreading, and again, that will not be new. We currently have arrangements for entering certain countries that you need to be vaccinated. We here in Trinidad and Tobago, in our forest, we have pools of yellow fever virus. And from time to time, the world knows that. And if we are going to leave here to go to certain countries, especially temporary countries, where there's no yellow fever, then you're required to provide proof that at home, You've been vaccinated. I think hepatitis is also of, uh, an outbreak of polio. And we, as a matter of fact, when we cancelled Carnival before 2020, it was in response to an, a, a risk of polio spreading in this country. So what we're getting here now in response to COVID is not new. It is only accelerated because of the communication system that is better. And that better communication system really should work for us in a positive way. Unfortunately, it is tending to want to work for us in a negative way. But vaccinating against a pathogen that could hurt is something that we've grown up with. I started in primary school. If you check my arm very carefully, you might see a pinprick there where I was vaccinated. Some people got a bigger scar. For, for, and, and now we, we have a lot more being said in, an, in a communicating environment that is much more effective. So the positive is more effectively out there, and so is the negative. Um, we just are relying on the good sense, as we have done from the beginning, and the good sense and cooperation of the population. We are not an illiterate society. We are not illiterate. We are well schooled and we should understand where our aims lie, not just at the national level, but at the personal level. And let me just say this it would be a hell of a burden to carry through your life if you really believe that the member of your family that caught COVID and died is because you, whoever you are, went to a party somewhere or to a bar somewhere and carried home to them. And as a result of your irresponsible conduct, because the statistics have shown that most people who have got infected got infected by friends, family, and associates. Not just walking through and meeting John Public. Eh? The people that you are closest to, the best chance of infecting, you spend more time with them and you sometimes are closer to them. And if you are the carrier that brought it into your household, resulting in death or hospitalization with a person, then that is a burden that you'll have to carry at the personal level, and I'm sure you don't want to carry that. Um, my question to you is, how many frontline medical workers do we have to vaccinate? And I ask that question against the backdrop of the president of the TTRNA expressing some disappointment in terms of the amount of nurses who were vaccinated from the gift that we received from Barbados. He said it was some underneath 20%, 20 I believe. Okay. So I am, I am sorry that my friend and good, good friend, A.D. Stewart, took that stance. It was limited simply by the number of vaccines. So we got 2,000. 
So we could only have vaccinated 1,000 uh, frontline healthcare nurses, um, personnel, nurses and doctors and so on. We had to keep the other 50% for their second dose. So there was no malintent. It was simply a limitation of the numbers. When we get the 33,600 fully on Tuesday, then we start going after all our health, frontline healthcare workers. The number that we have <clears throat> at this point in time of frontline healthcare workers is about 5,000. In total, there are about 6,000 nurses, but not all are frontline. So healthcare workers inclusive of frontline nurses, frontline doctors, frontline wards maids will add up to about 5,000. Okay? Um, I and may I add, when we got that gift, which as the Honorable Prime Minister said, was originally destined for members of parliament and so on, we said no, we would give it to healthcare workers. So I just want to comfort uh, my good friend, Mr. E.D. Stewart, there. I think there are any more COVID questions before yeah, I answer I this question. <laughs> 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 um, Minister, they are on the same issue of, of vaccines. Yes. Um, I know the departure is coming on Tuesday is from SK Pi. Mm -hmm. um, any consideration to purchase vaccines from any other institution that are making the US, um, Oxford, Ashes, and Okay. So we are have been in bilateral talks with other vaccine manufacturers since October 1st, 2020. That's roughly five, six, five or six months now. Those talks to date, the result of that is that every single ma vaccine manufacturer has told us at this point in time, it is difficult to commit because one, they are committed to either COVAX or two, government arrangements within their country of manufacture. We have had talks with AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson so far. Um, they have not indicated um, conclusively that they are ready to seal any bilateral deals with us, but we continue to pursue those avenues. That response, I know you are aware of the letter that was sent to your ministry yes. by Philly's Medical. Um, they are claiming that they can access 3 million doses of COVID shield. Um, any consideration to discuss? As, as we do with all approaches from the private sector, we, also, we always ask them from, for proof. And so far, no written proof has come that they can actually provide vaccines. The vaccine manufacturers have told us bluntly in no uncertain terms, at this time, they are only dealing with governments. They are, they are not even dealing with their own private sector local distributors. AstraZeneca has a local distributor in Trinidad for, for decades. They are not even talking to their local distributor. Same for Pfizer, same for Johnson & Johnson. So when the private sector approaches me like that, I always ask for confirmation, and so far we have not received any. No, I had a discussion with this particular um, Paris Medical, and they're saying that they have access through their distributor for Covishield, not AstraZeneca, from SK Bio and from the UK. They have it strictly through um, the Serum Institute of India. The Ashes and the Kadeshi with the Trinidad does not, as far as I am aware, have the connection to the Serum Institute in India. They have it with the Ashes and the Pharmaceutical Company in the UK. And therefore, they won't have access to the Kovashiv 3 million doses. Um, is that the information you have? Heard? And with this new information, if it's new, would you now consider having at least a conversation with various medical? Very medical. With who? Very. That is the firm that I was associated with in the public domain, that my wife was associated with, and so on. So I, look, look let I me just, let, me, let, me, let me just say something here. We spent enough time in this country going down those rabbit holes. As the head of the government of Trinidad and Tobago responsible for the population in this matter, we 
could say without contradiction to the population that we've made all reasonable approaches to AstraZeneca India and other authorized suppliers and there's no vaccine available for purchase today. And all the people who are telling you about have a million here or three million or five million there have turned out to be people you want to stay far from because this particular product, this particular product, the fact is it is not available in commercial trade. There is not one single CARICOM country that has been able to buy a dose of vaccine. That's an undisputed fact. And secondly, we have spent our effort as CARICOM and in some cases at the bilateral level seeking to put pressure on those who are in fact in receipt of the vaccines that are being produced to put the designated supply into the COVAX so that those of us whose pathway to vaccine is from COVAX will get vaccines. All we've had people come to us and tell us they could get vaccine, even hinting that they stole it from the US um, wherever. Come on, how could a government treat with that? And once we ask you, what is your source? Because there's no way two things are going to happen. One, we are not going to vaccinate our population with any product that does not carry the certification and authorization of the WHO. Secondly, we are not going to allow into this country knowingly vaccines that cannot stand the scrutiny of the entry of all medical products into the population of Trinidad and Tobago. So having said that, we are not dealing with sideshows. Because as far as we are aware, if the government as a sovereign can't buy it, and you can't tell me where you got it from, I'm not talking to you. And then going and talking about ministers, family and wife and cousin and things, just confusing the issue. There's too much nonsense going on in this country in the conversation. This is a serious time and serious business. Too much of our time is spent on nonsense. And in this kind of environment, you only have to sprinkle it for it to take root and flourish into a forest of stupidity. And all those who are pushing us in that direction, the thing they'd love to hear is that we go and get involved with somebody, pay taxpayers' money to somebody who take the money and they can't deliver the vaccine and now they sing hallelujah. We're not going down that road. Eh? We are dealing with authorized, certified support. And you could quote the government of Trinidad and Tobago through my statement that vaccines are not available for purchase commercially today. Everybody that we've approached as a sovereign country and all my colleagues in CARICOM, they've told us straight that we are unable to supply you or to take your order. Some keep talking to you, some don't talk to you at all. And everywhere there's an authorized center for producing vaccine or an authorized vaccine is being available from that source. We have been in contact with those arrangements because what's simple? The only vaccines that are authorized today by WHO, AstraZeneca, made in a couple of points around the world, Pfizer, and most recently Johnson & Johnson. And Johnson & Johnson would not be even out to the developed countries, not out until probably mid-year, June, July or thereabouts. So while we are in the land of hope, it is not commercially available for purchase off the shelf. And that is what's causing the problem. People are behaving as though we should just go and buy it and bring it. It's not available. And not only to us, little Trinidad and Tobago. Why do you think the United States is giving vaccines to Canada and Mexico? You think it's because the Canadian government or the Mexican government can't buy vaccine? Or that Mr. Trudeau is, is, is a slothful prime minister and he couldn't, he didn't take what steps? It, made, it simply means that the vaccines that are coming off the production line are going elsewhere, whether you have money or not. You look in Europe, you see the same thing. So let us not in Trinidad and Tobago keep this conversation going that is disturbing the public psyche by a handful of people who are just about creating mischief. We are almost there in our pathway. 
we're going to receive our first batch. What we have to be careful with now, and we are pressing it diplomatically, is that we get a stream of inflows under the COAX. So the U.S. has put a lot of money to pay in the COVAX, but that is only a part of the problem. If the money is there to pay for the COVAX stream of vaccine, but on the other hand, as it's produced in the factory, you can get it into where the money is, then you get no vaccine. So what we are pressing for, and as, as head of CARICOM, I've been on this pretty tight, like 24 hours a day for the last three weeks. What we are pressing for is to ensure that there's a flow of the produced vaccines into the COVAX. Because if we get this in March, and then we get no more for another two or three months, we would be in the same position we were a month ago. But on the other hand, if we are able to get a continuous supply, as is produced at the factory and COVAX is respected as our protection, then we all be, would be okay. And that is what we're aiming to head, that we get a continuous supply through the COVAX. And I've had high-level meetings with people who, who are influencing the situation, who understand our situation. And I'm confident that in the coming weeks, we will see some comforting improvement in this particular matter of the unavailability of vaccines for purchase or for supply to persons who are exposed like us and similar countries. In that same vein, um, do you think that CARICOM should come together and purchase as one in the in um, COVAX rather than individual countries purchasing on well, their own? Well, that is not whatever. The, all CARICOM countries that are in the COVAX, we have complied with what COVAX really is, which is to look to COVAX for a small portion of your requirement for initial. The COVAX supply is not meant to service the entire population. It is meant to deal with the initial part of the vaccination program worldwide. And then the second portion for your larger population numbers is the commercial marketplace where you are to get. But the mar that marketplace does not now exist. It will come into being sometime soon, but I don't know when, as more and more vaccines are produced. CARICOM has come together. CARICOM is together. You may recall the very first CARICOM heads of government meeting in 2021, the main statement that came out of that meeting, you may not have paid attention to it, but it was the subject of our deliberation in great earnestness and concern that vaccination is coming to the world, vaccines have been authorized, how do we get it? And the statement was to cover that because we suspected that it could have ended up in a situation where we could not access it even though it was available somewhere else in the world for other people. The second heads of government meeting we had recently, we upped the ante on that, saying that it is happening, that the vaccines are, there's a rollout of vaccines in the world, but those of us, like our CARICOM grouping, and elsewhere in the world, we have not received it. And you saw when the first batch of COVAX vaccine went to Africa, to, when Ghana got the first batch. Yeah. A population of 30 million people, they got, what, 600,000. 30 million, 30 odd million people, they get 600,000. And that's so therefore, you're not, you're not vaccinating your population. You're starting a process, hoping and expecting a continuous supply. And that's where we are in a similar situation. CARICOM, I've seen it said, that we, we refuse vaccine from India, but the Prime Minister going to get vaccine from Africa. I consider that an irresponsible race-baiting statement by the opposition leader, because as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, I have never refused. On the contrary, we made every effort to get vaccine from AstraZeneca of India. It's still not available to us now. We also, right, our plight is observed by the African bloc that saw that we were not able in the marketplace to get. But because of their tens of millions, and they will get some as the companies begin to put with big orders, they said to us, through, Car through CARICOM and PAHU, but mainly CARICOM, putting together a, a, a request list, and all of us, except about two or three countries that have small populations and who would have got some vaccination from, for example, take Dominica. Dominica has 100,000 people and they got um, 70,000 from, in, from India 
So that, would, that percentage wise would be a big input in Dominica. And of course, the British colonies of um, like Montserrat and uh, the, the Virgin Islands and Bermuda, they will get taken care of by, by Britain. But the rest of CARICOM, we are in fact on this list, put the, um, the African medical um, platform, we are on that list, and Trinidad and Tobago's um, request in there is for just over a quarter million doses, and that is only going to come into play, hopefully, April forward, when they get their large batch. But there's a commitment by CARICOM and the African bloc to um, share when a large order purchase is serviced by the producer. Because in short, the, problem, the problem is that once the approval has come, the vaccines were not available in the mountains, they just shovel it up and sit it out. They're going to be made as you go forward with tremendous demand, huge demand, and limited supply. That's what we've been experiencing across the world. And what we are saying as small countries is to share the supply, even though there is a short supply. One non-COVID question. Minister Diao Singh, I'm not sure if the Minister of National Security as well is aware, but we were made informed that a grave at the Londonville Cemetery was dug yesterday evening. The body was buried. I'm not sure whether or not, you know, there are public health ramifications to such. Uh, or I believe uh, a district medical officer or some person in authority. So. I have heard what you said, and I'll be in contact with the police to find out what we've done about it. Minister, I'm as happy on your feet. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, Timothy oh. from TTT News. Um, I know the re-registration of Venezuelan migrants would have ended yesterday. Can you give an update on that? Because I know earlier, I think you said the numbers were a bit low when compared to last year. Can you just give us an update on that? Okay, well, I'm happy to, s to be told that the numbers actually increased over the past week. So right now they're tallying it. I've asked for a tally over the weekend. The last count I got was just over 13,000. I have been in conversation with the Honorable Prime Minister. So when I get the final number on Monday, if I deem it to be necessary, we may grant a, a short extension because the fact is whoever has not re-registered, you're now outside of the ambit of the law and subject to deportation. So I really want to give that last opportunity. There were a lot of difficulties with persons. They thought it was mandatory, for example, to have a job letter. Of course, it's not mandatory to have a job letter. And there were some, unfortunately, increasingly, employers who did not want to facilitate by giving job letters. The same thing with some landlords. So I've taken that into account. I'm waiting for the final number. And on Monday, we'll make an announcement. Thank you. Question for the Prime Minister. You can't be, um Raphael John Lal from Garden Media. Um, Prime Minister, at what point do you think the country would need to reach to return to a lockdown? And you've emphasized that the country is in dire economic streets. You've said that the country does not have the resources to support another lockdown. Would you consider no, in, in, in the way that we supported it before? If, if we have to lock down, we could we have we have to, we have the, the wherewithal to lock down, but the lockdown carried with it last year a certain governmental support and response, and that's what I'm talking about. Would the government consider going to the IMF and international multilateral lending agencies, as some other countries have done over the last year or so, given the severe economic challenges countries around the world have faced? Well. We have been taking our decisions without the IMF. What we have done in 2020 is what some countries are doing now in the context of what you said, seeking external support to support COVID lockdown and so on. We did borrow, but we didn't borrow from the IMF. We borrowed from local banks, and so mainly local banks. But there was a huge chunk of borrowing that took place last year driven by the need to support our COVID responses. So without the IMF, we did that last year. And what I'm saying is that if we find ourselves in a similar situation and having the response of a lockdown being the only sensible response at that time, 
we will not be able to provide the kind of governmental support that took place in early 2020 because we don't have those resources. If what you're asking me is whether we'll then not be able to go out and borrow more money to do that, well then my answer to that will simply be if the population's life is threatened, we want to stay alive and we will do what we have to do. I don't know that going to the IMF is that what you have to do. I'm first and foremost saying to the population, your personal behavior could prevent us from having to do that. But once the population's interest is being served, the actions to do it is what the government will take. The country has been in economic doldrums for the last few years. When do you see the economy in terms of GDP returning to positive GDP? Do I wish I could say I could see that. But what I'm, until we get over the challenges that you are familiar with, with the um, COVID, um, just being able not to lose ground is a positive. And as long as we don't lose ground, then we can only be going forward. Because our economy is largely open now. The restrictions are, I, my, by my own um, amateur calculation, it's, about a, it's only about a 20% of the economy that is not functioning because of a restriction. And of course, as we remain healthy, that 80% could grow towards 100%. What I'm appealing for is for let us not have actions that could cause a rolling back. Because you remember there was a time when we literally shut the doors. In April, we shut down. The factories were closed. The public service was closed. We don't want to go back there. But if you look at what are the areas that are restricted, bars, you can buy drinks, but you can't consume them on the side. Restaurants, you can sell food, but you can't sell alcohol. The border is closed. I think we've brought back most, by most, I mean 90 odd percent of the persons who were accidentally caught outside, we brought them back home. And we brought back home many people who live outside and who come home for safety and security. And we're still doing that. So other than that, Right? The one thing that we look at as a yardstick of our success is that our health system has remained viable and we have not been overwhelmed in any area. And we've maintained, to some convenience, to some people, a state-sponsored quarantine system, which has worked wonders for us. Some people spend time quarreling with those barriers, but I ask such persons, look at the alternative because had we not done those things what would have been the alternative and, and, and the economic growth that you're talking about would not be on the horizon at all at any time in the near future if we are in fact continuously infected in such a way that the population's response is just trying to stay alive with hospitals overflowing, healthcare workers overwhelmed, and of course, jobs disappearing because of the, the consequences of this country. I'm sure, just one last question for me. I'm sure that there are persons who may be very curious. Where are you getting this thing on why you? Actually, yeah. <laughs> but, um, the minister has answered that, no? Please, please do. <laughs> So what I've seen now, or I haven't been able to view it obviously because I'm in here, but a number of persons, including the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the IATF, have sent the video to me. I think it's somebody, Chappie, it is how it's labeled. So right now we're checking with the Central Division. It has not been verified, so that verification exercise will take place and the police are going to, to look into it once it is verified that it is an actual event that took place recently. All right, so, so that's the police response to it. Thank you. And yes, Prime Sorry, look, they, they, Sorry. they just sent it in, Prime Minister, just now. This is... Okay, an investigation has started. It is confirmed they are waiting the funeral agency to provide information, and an investigation has started by Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Thank you. Yeah, Alicia, so, you have a question? Just one quick question for you, because some yeah, different kind of question. Yeah. COVID question. Some persons may be curious um, to find out, based on the research that you've done 
so far on both vaccines, Pfizer and AstraZeneca, both of which are WHO approved, do you have a preference in terms of which one you would like to take? Personally, I don't. Personally, you mean? No, no, no. My, my, my uh, point of reference is WHO certification and authorization. I mean, that is good enough for me. So um, I have seen it where in some countries um, persons are uh, refusing AstraZeneca, they want Pfizer. Those are brand names. I, as I said from the beginning, I trust the science and I trust the infrastructure at the WHO that if a clearance is given, that that clearance will be based on the appropriate scientific involvement. So on that basis, I will take what is available and I will say the same thing to the population. And this thing about labeling vaccine by country, that too is not a distraction. Hmm. Eh? The, the vaccine is not country labeled. It is labeled by the science and its efficacy by the product that is produced. The, the vaccine coming from India is not the Indian vaccine. Correct. And the one coming from Korea is not the Korean vaccine. Eh? That is just all part of the conversation that is not useful. Wherever it's coming from has to be a place that the WHO certify the site and the WHO certify the product. That's what we need before we give clearance or accept the product. So when will you be uh, taking the, you and the health minister, taking the, the vaccine? Well, I would, at uh, the first opportunity um, that it becomes available to me, I expect to be in Tobago on the day that I've heard, and it appears as though I may be having to take mine in Tobago, and I'll do that in Tobago without any hesitation, because our health system in Tobago is part of the health system of Trinidad and Tobago. And if I'm in Tobago when it's available, from what the minister outlined this morning, it sounds as if the day when I'm in Tobago it will be when the Tobago population would be receiving it, and I'll receive it then. And I'm, let me go a little further and say, I see one of my colleagues in the parliament um, making a whole performance about who in parliament should get. And I would simply say to all parliamentarians, all parliamentarians, if vaccines are available and you want to take it, then please take it. Former Senator, because we cannot plead for his family who are non nationals to return or be allowed to return to Trinidad. Um, other families have been making similar pleas. Uh, any consideration for, for that type of exemption? I mean, I was a little surprised to see that at, at the front of a newspaper today. My recollection of this issue is it had first arisen sometime last year when there was a converse, when at the time we weren't allowing non-nationals back in. I told the public servants at that stage, my understanding is applications for permanent residency may have been made, by all means allow the family back in. I don't think it was taken up. The information that came to me today, I understand why. My understanding is that his wife, as he outlined, went off to study sometime, and the studies only completed at the end of the third call last year, in on around August, right now, from what I read, there may also be some difficulties with flights. They applied in November, and again, in the new system, only applied on 3rd of February of this year. So I've asked the public servants to take a look at it to grant approval, and I went further than that. I asked, I would like to see all of our nationals or persons who have applied from Africa, because we had done a clearance there before. Right? We were looking at it at stages, those in the Middle East, those in Africa, you all would recall in India and this type of thing, and at those stages. So I had previously given instructions to facilitate all of those. So again, I've asked for that to be done today because I guess people, as their lives unfold, so I'd like to use the opportunity to also make the point. Some of the stories that are given to me and some of the information provided to me don't always, and I'm not referring here at all to the former senator and his family, but exactly as the Prime Minister said, I would go further. It is almost 100% of those persons who were caught outside. There are persons, we're seeing it now, who are domiciled away, persons who go away, they spend months away and want to come back, and that's being facilitated. I've said before, you have persons who are leaving Trinidad on all these CAL flights, and then they're demanding 
to turn around and come back under all sorts of claims. Right now, every single day is persons claiming funerals, persons claiming sick family members. And I had the ridiculous information provided to me this morning because, of course, those are humanitarian cases we've been trying to facilitate where we can, where some persons who are saying they're coming home for funerals, when we then provide the flight, they say, well, nah, I can't come on that flight, I'll come on a later flight, which leads me to think, but if you're coming for a funeral, you have to quarantine when you get here, aren't you going to miss the funeral? So there is still a lot of that disinformation, and this is, I repeat, not connected to, to Mr. Ubika at all. We, for a long time now, we've been facilitating that. Spouses of nationals um, who are not nationals, non-nationals, once they've applied for their permanent residency, and even some who have not applied, that has been facilitated. Someone asked, sorry, someone asked me to ask this question. I'm not sure who wants to take it, but they were making me aware that the importation of dogs um, was halted, or animals, and do we have an update on that? Yeah. All right. So again, in the height of COVID and when we we're dealing with COVID, you all would recall, and this is months ago, there was scientific evidence and it was after discussions with the chief medical officer that said that COVID can be transported. It can be spread via animals. So at, at that time, we had taken a decision. Let's just pause on that. Also, we were focused on the human element. We we're focused on getting on nationals home. In the past couple days, weeks, we've been having conversation, and right now there is a finalization of that conversation between the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries with the Chief Veterinary Officer. My position is national security no longer has a role to play in this. Once it is given the clearance by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Vet, they have put in place certain systems where there's going to be a similar quarantine system for persons, pets coming in. But I say this without any hesitation, our focus was on our nationals. And, and when people kept bombarding me about it, I said, listen, I am more concerned about our nationals, our physical men, women, children getting in, than persons, animals. But we are at that stage now, and hopefully health and agriculture will work it out, and, and it will be able to be facilitated. Well, I think the conversation has reached to the dogs. Thank you. To stop. <laughs> Two and a half to the minutes. And I'm just mentioning, again, for not, not having misinformation, even without COVID, dogs coming into this country had to be, has, have to be quarantined because of our anti-rabies protection um, systems. So uh, whether they come in or not, when they come, they require to be quarantined. Um, let me just end by saying again that we are approaching a period or a season. I can't remember this happening before. A season where all I am now are reminded that um, with the coming of Easter here and uh, Baptist Liberation, Good Friday, we also have Holy Pagua. Is this weekend coming up? So what a week, what a weekend, what enticement. And I simply want to say to everybody involved in these national activities, religious or otherwise, to enjoy what you're doing, but please remember, do not congregate because that is where the risk is. And if you're outside of your home, simple thing, wear your mask. Let us look forward to the police reporting that they have had to intercede, intervene in very few areas with very few persons in the days ahead. And the next two weeks are critical, if only because I desperately want to be able to get our primary school children out there safely after the Easter festivities. Thank you all very much, and we look forward to the blessings of Almighty God. Thank you.